We'll focus at some point in this episode on a moderately loud foghorn, but not straight away. We're putting the musk collar and assorted gubbins together like an IKEA kit. The bolts the stainless collar came with were zinc coated, almost like the supplier was begging for them to corrode, so they're swapped out with stainless ones more similar to the collar body. The box section crossbeam is glass fibre, with very much the characteristics you'd expect. A little more flex compared to if it was steel, but much lighter and with no electrical conduction issues. As I do up all the bolts, I do need to be conscious that flagrant overzealous wielding of spanners could over torque and deform the box section. I'm using wide washers to spread out the clamping force and trust that all will be well. It doesn't need painting, of course, but we don't want the exterior of Alan looking like a bag of Alan! So I have once again placed form somewhere alongside function. This will cause widespread upset, I'm sure. I'm rather happy though with this repurposed collar and even happier that it cooperatively slides neatly over the stainless steel tube mast and into position. I'm choosing a sensible location, I hope, high enough so that it doesn't get in the way of those using Allen's top access hatch, and so the antennas aren't interfered with, but not so high that it gets in the way of where I want to mount the wind generator. Here that is, by the way, the generator mounting tube, a waterproofing PVC cap, as the inside of the mast ideally needs to stay dry, and then a spiral of 24 volt waterproof LED lights, and also our crossbeam. A crossbeam that now needs populating. Well, in its inimitable style, British weather has conspired against us. Today I was hoping to populate the mast with all sorts of bits and bobs and gadgets, but it's 40, 45 mile an hour gusts of wind outside today, and lots of hail and rain when we're lucky. So anyway, I'll do the quick run through inside instead of being able to enjoy uh, a little bit of outside time. It is now currently sunny outside, but I bet you the second I set up the camera outside, it will all start again. So um, we'll start with, I guess, the most straightforward ones. This is going to be the VHF antenna. And it is a stainless steel whip antenna. And this will be going on one side of the mast's uh, crossbeam. Uh, at the moment, it's not wired up, and it came with a, uh, a, a load of coax cable, which um, I need to wire up myself. I guess that's how they save money. Um, so I'm just stripping that back, folding the shielding back, and that can then be connected through using the fittings that they supply me with. Uh, it should be quite easy, although the mount they give you is for uh, mounting to a, to, to a vertical structure, and the holes are rather too big for the, my crossbeam. So, and I, I can't really see the point of having this step out, which is about half a foot, if I've already got the distance from um, uh, from the mast itself, from the wind generator which is going to go on top, and also from the other antennas. So I might possibly bend this flat, repaint it because I don't want things up there that don't uh, follow Alan's colour scheme, and then I might just drill some new mounting holes through here. Anyway, I'll, I'll see what I think about that, or I to make, it, make my own mount. So that's going to be quite straightforward. That can then, uh, all, all of the, the cables, by the way, are going to run down the middle of the mast and through a hole in the top of the uh, module here, which can then come down to uh, the radio, the AIS itself, and to get its power. Next um, is the, let, let's, let's do the AIS. So this is the antenna that it comes with. Um, this is actually a much neater mount, which I should be able to screw directly um, so not screw bolts directly onto the side of my mast crossbeam, and then it comes with plenty of cable which I can run down through and then shorten to the right length. There's no point having coils of unnecessary uh, power there. Uh, that also comes with a uh, a GPS, its own GPS, and I've ordered a mount for it because it didn't come with one. And again, it's just got a coax on the end. Again, this is too long, so I'll have to shorten it. But rewiring a coax isn't too hard, so that will then sit. Actually, I've not decided yet because uh, it doesn't need to be separated in the same way that the two antennas need to be. Anyway, I've got that. And finally, there's the horn, which I have just shown you me rewiring. It wasn't very complicated. And that will, once it's in its mount, which I've been repainting because it was this horrible sort of chromey thing. Wow, that wind is quite intense. You might be able to hear that. Um, the entire boat just shook. Uh, that's currently going to go this is soon going to go inside uh, its own its own repainted housing and then I'm probably going to mount that pointing forward on the mast itself. Right, I need to probably hop outside and stop things blowing away because although everything's lashed down, 
that's kind of getting a bit insane. And I've already seen loads of stuff with other people's flying around the yard. So, right. Having galloped to the rescue of assorted windborne belongings outside, horn time. It does make a noise which is pleasing. But on having a look inside, I was less delighted. The tight fit within the horn housing pinched the power cables, and these should at least have been sleeved to avoid an unsolicited severing. I don't like the wires anyhow, so I'm swapping out the old ones for good quality silicon, and I'll double heat shrink the section where their discarded cousins were being pinched. I couldn't have picked a less helpful camera angle. A couple more improvements. The innards of the horn will corrode if left like this, and so I'm priming the steel and then painting, plus I'm coating the two screw contacts with some quick setting electrical insulating gel. I'm hoping all this upgrading will buy the horn many more years of service than it would have straight out of the box. As if by magic, the housing is no longer a gaudy chrome and white, but Allen orange, and this is where the double reinforcement will go, to protect the wires. I could use a gland or grommet, but I won't. The incessant wind and assorted other meteorological irritations abated for a time, so excitement could recommence outside, attaching things to Allen's instrument mast. First, a quick task. Sorting out the power cable running down from the LED strip. I considered rewiring it, but it seems of a nice quality. The LEDs are bonded to the mast with my favourite Bostic Mastic. Then on to the VHF antenna. I'm putting the antennas right on the ends, although keeping in mind I do need to add a ring anchor near to the span ends, so I can stabilise by running a tensioned wire rope down to Allen's shell. I did, as I moved before, flatten, cut and then repaint the supplied antenna mounting arm. It just needed a 5mm hole drilled to allow me to attach it to the corresponding hole in the glass fibre box section. I'm not going through all the way and bolting. Instead, this calls for a specialised type of rivet. The aluminium peels back and splays out to the side as the mandrel is withdrawn, and this is designed to fix into blind voids where you want to spread out the force across more surface area of a softer material like glass fibre. I'm going to segue at this moment onto a test that I did. Originally it was to see if there were candidates for setting handrail anchors into Allen's shell where blind setting into voids is unavoidable, and they failed to impress for such important work, but I saw the potential for applications like this. A plate of fibreglass and three corresponding strips of fibreglass of the same thickness and length. I'm trying two types of wide pressure blind pop rivets, and both, due to the shapes needed to be achieved, are aluminium. I did try to find steel, but presumably it wouldn't deform enough with the limited force of a hand riveter. The first variety peels back into four curls, and the other splays out with three legs, and here they're not set into anything, so you can see the difference more clearly. A third option is to use 3M's 5200 adhesive, famed for its mighty strength bonding fibreglass to more fibreglass. It's going to be a peel test, and this is pretty brutal. The best performance and PSI stats from fixing and adhesive manufacturers tend to quote for sheer strength instead. First I lift up the strip held down by the peel rivet and immediately regret not using much thicker fibreglass. The rivet holds firm and the fibreglass fails. Then I go for the rivet that I'll call the splaying rivet, although their real name is treble or treble, unsure which. This is disappointing. The wide flange deforms pretty easily, although the legs on the other side seem okay. Finally the 5200. This fails pretty easily too, and the fibreglass remains intact. This is the second time that I've found a caveat to the legend that is 5200. Firstly, it doesn't bond that well to unprepared metal, and this time the peel strength isn't great, although most people are looking for shear strength and use a much greater surface area for bonding. The sealant itself ripped, but also some of it pulled away from the fibreglass, so the mode of failure is mixed. Only the peel rivet held up with any honour in this, I grant you, rather limited and specific test. The blind side parts of the rivets are most unscathed. Ok, back to the mast, and I'm using one of these peel rivets. Quick, easy, doesn't crush the box, and can be easily drilled out in the distant future should the mount need to come off. I don't want cables flapping around all over the place, or vulnerable to snagging, so it'll head up into the box section cavity. I decided to step drill my way into that same cavity, to a size that fits one of my silicon friction fit grommets. Of course, there's dust in there, and I took care not to breathe in at the wrong moment before the grand puff. Finally, with lungs remaining free of fibreglass dust, we can feed the cable through. It would be somewhat cruel to subject you to the same procedure again at the other end of the span, where I'm fixing the AIS antenna and the GPS receiver halfway along, 
But the good news for us all is that they ended up wedded to the mast span and we can move on as majestically as the sunset that evening. Quite a neat setup, and although the LED strip isn't conventional, it will work in full compliance with small boat laws and it draws very little power. The other three thingies haven't fallen off yet, which is good, and once the horn housing is dry, I can attach that below the span. Now for everyone's favourite chore, cable management. They're all a bit different, some stiffer than others which may impact how I route them. I do have a few aims. I do not want half a dozen different glands needing to be fitted. I want to keep the inside of the mast dry. I want to avoid the cables being damaged when inside, and I want to be done with all this before supper time. My solution is one large waterproof nylon screw gland. All the cables will just fit inside. The hole needed to mount a PG-19 size gland is fairly beefy, so I start off with a couple of cobalt drill bits for the stainless, and then hope that my budget price step drill bit will cut the hard grade 316 metal. It turns out that it whizzes through like a knife through butter, and soon we have just enough room for the gland. Dry fitting will come first, but when I'm happy, I'll use a sealant to properly complete the assembly, even though the friction fit holds it well. The fiddly bit begins. Cables that get tangled, and some are more amenable than others to being fed through a narrow aperture and at an angle, but they all still fit. As a finishing touch, I'll use a blob of soft all-weather sealant to stop water gradually passing through the little gaps around the wires. Strictly, these glands are only for one cable, and the circular seal closes down around it. Luckily, the AIS cable was rather stiff, so it doubled as a sort of cable routing wire to allow me to pass the softer wires down the couple of metres to the mast's bottom, as they otherwise would have probably snagged and curled up halfway down. They will end up heading to their respective homes inside Alan's cabin. With a final adjustment to the gland and the amount of cable slack, the dry fit is done. I'll crack out the sealant in private. And yes, I did want a second episode this week, but I just didn't manage the edit in time. Sorry. Alan's diesel generator has been eating up my time, and my patience, as the manufacturers have designed it specifically so that the smallest maintenance task requires 20 prior steps to be completed to access any given component. It's been warm enough to glass over the newly waterproof fender strip repair though. Summer must be nigh. Bye. <laughs>